So we've been going through the book of Acts um, for a couple months now. And as we've gone through the book of Acts, we have seen that, that Christ, Jesus, commissioned the apostles back in Acts chapter 1, uh, just before he ascended. And he told them to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them, because when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them, they would become witnesses. And that's exactly what happened. You had the commissioning, then you had, on Pentecost, 10 days later, the empowering of the apostles. And the apostles did open up their mouth, and they began to speak with languages they didn't know. They began to speak with all these foreign languages. People from around the world heard the message, and the church grew mightily. In fact, that day, 3,000 souls were added to the church. And so they continued to do mighty things and, 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 and proclaim the word. But with the growth of the church, the strength of the message, the growth of the church, came opposition. The leaders of the land didn't like it. Because the message of Jesus Christ dying for your sins was combined with the concept that he was given over to death by the Jewish people. That every time the apostles would proclaim the message, they also proclaimed the fact of the guilt of the people for handing over Messiah. So the growth of the church was then co-joined with the persecution of the church. But in spite of the persecution of the church, the church was emboldened. Rather than running away, they came back, if you remember, after Peter and John were released, and they prayed. And then the apostles were, were all arrested, and they came back and they prayed. And they prayed that they would have boldness, and that they would not buckle down to the threats of, of the religious authorities and, and the political authorities. And the walls of the house were shaken, you remember? And the, and the church came out and everyone, not just the apostles, but now everyone, all of the believers, began to speak boldly. And the word of God multiplied. And the church wasn't just added to daily. So 3,000 souls were saved. The church was added daily. Then, you know, Peter and John preached again, and it was up to 5,000 men. But it was still just the apostles. But now at this moment... The apostles, or the, the entirety of the church, begins to proclaim the message. And we're told that the word of God was multiplied. And that believers were beginning to be multiplied to the church. Multiplication. But again, it was co-joined with persecution. That the persecution now was not going to be just targeted to the apostles, who were the only ones proclaiming the message. And so he's trying to, to, to shut up the voice. But now as the whole church is proclaiming the message, the spread of persecution has to go to the whole church. Um, two weeks ago, we saw in the beginning of Acts chapter 6 that along with the growth, there was a little bit of um, growth pains in that the, the widows of the, the Hellenists, or at least the Hellenists, the the, the um, Greek, Greekified Jews, if you would, um, who have come to know Christ as their Savior, you know, started accusing the, the ones who were non-Hellenized of, and specifically then the apostles, of missing their, their widows in the daily distribution on purpose. And so they had to deal with that. Coming out of that, again, coming out of that, there was the, the choosing of disciples, or sorry, deacons, in order to minister to those widows, and other things. We'll come back to that in just one moment. But as a result of them handling the internal struggles, again, what happened? The church grew. The church multiplied. In fact, we're told that there were a multitude of the priests who came to the faith. Again, that intensifies what? The persecution. Because now, all of a sudden, it's not just common people getting saved, but now you're starting to affect the voting class, if you would. The priests are, are starting to get involved in this thing. And so now it begins to come even more and more. And today, we're going to see, we're going to look at from Acts 6, verse 8, then all the way down through chapter 7, verse 60, 
And no, I'm not going to necessarily go verse by verse by verse because we'll be here for a long time. And I don't mind that, but I'm sure some of your stomachs will start growling. And, uh, but the reality is we're going to look at this guy named Stephen, who was the first martyr of the church. And what you need to understand is the word martyr is the Greek word martos or martyreo. Martos is, is the, the noun. Martyreo is the, the verb literally means to be a witness. So it's someone who dies for what they believe, for what they are declaring. Now, we use it from the perspective in Christianity, and we look at the, the line of martyrs throughout the centuries. But you can be a martyr for something other than Jesus. There are a lot of people who die for a cause. They are martyrs for their cause. Stephen is the first recorded martyr for Jesus Christ. And there is a lot for us to learn as we consider Stephen. Stephen, if you remember, was one of the men chosen to be a servant of the church, a deacon. Remember the word diakonos literally just means servant, minister. He was one that was chosen and so there was a list of qualifications in the beginning of Acts 6 that we're going to look at. And it's part of, then, his description as we consider his character. The first thing we see in Acts 6, in the very beginning, and part of that, the, the character traits that were, um, were given, is that, verse 3, we're told, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. Okay? So they had to be full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, and so they chose these individuals. And then as they were talking about the ones that they chose, specifically about Stephen then, when it comes to Stephen, verse 5, it says, The saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. So they had to choose individuals, right, who were full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. And the first one that we're told about that they chose is Stephen. And the first thing we're told about Stephen is that he was a man full of faith. Faith. Note then down in verse, um, where am I at? Verse 30, um, verse 8, sorry, as we come down and we talk about Stephen now. And Stephen, full of faith and power, okay? So Stephen, whenever somebody was describing Stephen, what were the common traits? He was full of what? He was full of faith. What else would you say he was full of then? If he's full of faith, of, he's full of wisdom, full of Holy Spirit, and full of holy, and, oh, holy power, good, and full of power. So Spirit, Holy Spirit, power, what else would he be? What, what, how would you combine all those things together? Where does wisdom come from? Say again. God. From our perspective, who lives inside me? The Holy Spirit. So who's going to... Who convicts me of righteousness, judgment, and sin? The Holy Spirit. Who works within my conscience to to convict me? The Holy Spirit. Who, when 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 I pray to God for wisdom, who's going to give it to me? Holy Spirit. Do you understand? Who is going to empower the disciples? The Holy Spirit. This is a man who is full of faith because he's full of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to think about that. Okay, um, Peter. Peter, and we're not going to turn to there, but this is the account of Peter walking on water. You guys know the story, right? So the boat is, 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 is getting ready to go under or whatever, you know, and all of a sudden they see this ghost walking on the water. And they're, they're crying out, right? And Jesus says, it's just, just, it's just me. But Peter says what? Say again? Well, he steps out of the boat, but first he says what? What's he say? If it's really you, command me to come out to you. Now, that's kind of dumb. (laughs) I mean, I can say what you want, you know, but I'm thinking there's a whole lot of false spirits out there. Yeah, come on out of the boat. Anyways, but Jesus says, Peter, come out. And Peter, by faith, by faith, Peter does what? He gets out of the boat. And what does he do? He what? He starts walking. Give me more information. He walks toward Jesus 
on water. Important part there, on water. There wasn't a sandbar. <laughs> it's one thing to get out of a boat and just start walking. I've done that in Canada a lot of times, but I've never gotten on a boat in the middle of the river and started walking. That, that would kind of go, no, bad moment, right? And so he gets out of the boat by faith and walks on water. But then all of a sudden, in the midst of the walking on water, before he gets to Jesus, he what? He takes his eyes off of Jesus. And what happens, Michelle? It's like me in Canada. Yeah. Um, okay. And so he takes his eyes off of Jesus, and all of a sudden he falters. I'm mindful how many times Jesus said, O oh, ye of little faith. O oh, ye of little faith. Matthew 6, it may not seem like it plays here, but later I think you'll see where it does. This is Jesus talking about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But note the, the context of what he says about it. He's talking about worrying. Worrying. He says, if God so clothes the grass of the field and today, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into it, will he not much more, what? Clothe you. What's the basis of, of, of what he's going to say? The faithfulness of God. Do you really believe that God is watching over you? That's really the statement. Do you believe that God is watching over you? Do you really believe that God knows what you need? Do you really believe that God knows what you can handle? If God does this for, the, for, the, for just the grass, how much more will we do for you? O ye of little faith. Therefore, do not what? Do not worry. Worry, as you can see at the bottom, is the antithesis of faith. Worry is the antithesis of faith. If you are struggling with worry and anxiety, now I get there's uh, the, the, the mental, da, da 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 I get all that. Body, soul, spirit, I'm there. Okay, I get that. However, here's a generalized statement, and I can back this up from Proverbs and multiple, multiple places in Scripture. If you are full of anxiety, if you're full of worrying, then really it's, you're not focusing on Jesus Christ. Now, I get the fact that there's a battle that goes on in the mind sometimes. I get it, okay? However, I can tell you that as a whole, generically speaking, the rule is an improper focus. Now, I get the exceptions. But worrying is the antithesis of faith. Because I'm focusing on the waves. I'm focusing on the giants. I'm focusing on money rather than focusing on he who is able to provide exceeding abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think because he knows what I have need of. For me not to worry about tomorrow, tomorrow has enough worries of its own. But rather for me today at this moment is to seek first his kingdom in his righteousness. Stephen had a decision to make. It's fun proclaiming the word of God. Boldly proclaiming it. And as we're going to see in a moment, in fact, I'll put the slide up, Stephen, with his works, was even greater. He was doing great works. And that's all exciting. That's a whole lot of fun. Until what? Until it's not, that's right. Until it draws attention, until the persecution comes. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, we know 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, it's not a works, lest any man should boast. But verse 10 goes on and says, for we are what? His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And so there should be good works coming out of you. It may not be to the point where you are healing people, that you are doing the phenomenal things that, that God enabled Stephen to do, but people ought to look at your life, and they ought to know there's something different about you. One calls the heart. I know it's a real spiritual uh, special series, but over the series, Anna has really enjoyed it. But in over the what series did we just finish looking at? Nine, nine, ser nine years of this thing. Anyways, but I've joked over the years that this is all about the redemption of Her Henry Gowan. So if you've ever watched this thing, for years I've said that the theme of this thing is the, the redemption of Henry Gowan. Well, in, if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert, okay? He, he 
he kneels down in the jail cell and he prays. Now, they don't show what he prays about. That's a sad thing. But he basically, he's given his life to Christ. That's really, if you understand what's happening, that's what's coming. He's, he's, he's surrendering to God at this moment. It's an exciting moment. When someone comes to the place, and they do that. But what was most exciting about that was that in the same one, Henry had blown up the, the, um, uh, the mind, thank you. And um, anyways, that's why he's in jail, because he, and then he confesses that he's done this. And he's, he's done this for, for the good of the community. Anyways, but the guy that he was partnering with, who had partnered with him in the past, came back and said, because now he's, he's everything he wants, and he's just ruthless, right? Everything he wants is gone. And he says, I banked on the fact that Henry was the same man. And it's clear that he's not the same man anymore. Isn't that kind of cool? Now, again, they didn't do the Jesus thing, and the but they got all the other parts of it. That when you come to Christ, you become a what? A new creation. And people know it. People will see it. By faith, through God's grace, you have the privilege of having the adoption. And now you become his son. And life changes. That was Stephen. And everybody saw it. But they didn't like it. We have these detractors that, that come, we're told, from the, the synagogue of the freedmen. And so if you look at um, chapter um, 6, yeah, verse 9. It says, And there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Sicily and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders, the scribes, and they, they, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs by which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. First of all, these detractors were from the synagogue of the freedmen. Two things real quick about it. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. The, the Greek is uh, libertines, uh, libertinas. There is three thought processes on that one. You can research all that if you want. Where I tend to fall on this one is that these are um, Jewish individuals who um, were freed by Roman law, okay? Um, and so um, I go to that from the perspective that these are also from Cilicia, okay? Paul um, refers later that he's from Cilicia, and he states, if you remember, when he's um, arrested and they're getting ready to beat him, and he says, is it lawful for you to beat a Roman citizen? Right? And, and, the, and the soldier says what? Well, how did you become that? It took me a lot of money. He says, I was born a Roman citizen. That's woo. Okay? So my mind is that he is probably a part of this synagogue of the freedmen. Because at the end of this, we're going to find out, right, that when they were taking off their robes, where were they placing them? At the feet of Paul or who was Saul at the time. Okay? that he was the ringleader, I think, of this whole thing, right? He was the one who was, was being excited for God, if you would, zealous for God, okay? Jealous for the name of Yahweh and wanting to destroy this, um, this attack against Judaism, that, which is what he saw. That's what he saw. And so regardless of how you want to play that one right now, and so... I think that that's, so in my brain, that's where this is at, okay? That's who these guys are, and you can do some research on it. Secondly, what's really exciting here, though, is they were not able to resist. Do you get this? Which means they were what? Trying to. But Stephen wasn't, at least in the description that we have of him, he wasn't sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, 
like Saul, who became Paul, did. When Saul, I mean, remember Saul becomes Paul, he's the one who wrote the book of Romans. I think he wrote the book of Hebrews. He wrote all these epistles, right? I mean, Saul, who became Paul, was a very brilliant man of the law. Stephen wasn't part of that group. I mean, do you remember when Peter and John stood before the Sanhedrin? And they confounded the Sanhedrin? All they could say was what? They'd been with Jesus. They'd been with Jesus. And so here is Stephen beginning to proclaim truth. And they're not able to resist it. They're doing whatever they can to try to squelch it. They can't do it. Why? Because Jesus declared, back in Luke 21, okay, that at the end he says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You don't have to worry about what you're going to say in the day when persecution comes. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be prepared. We know that, right? That we, we need to um, sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, and we need to be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks us, a reason for the hope that's within us, with all meekness and fear. We're supposed to study or to be diligent to present ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? So the word of God is, 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 um, um, declares overwhelmingly that we ought to be studying his word. We ought to know his word. We ought to talk about his word. But exactly what I'm going to say in the moment, I don't have to worry about it. There are times when I'm preaching, when I'll say something, and I'll think to myself as I'm saying, ooh, that was really good. Because I wasn't planning on it. it. It wasn't any part of it. But I've been all week, what? Studying and meditating and, 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 and thinking about the passage, right? But I wasn't thinking about a certain thing. And then I think to myself, oh, man, I've got to go back and listen to that later on, hear what I said, because that was good. And, um, and, and that sounds prideful, and I don't mean it that way. But there are, do you believe that the Holy Spirit is residing in you? It, that you are a child of God. If you're a child of God, that you're the temple of God, the Holy Spirit is living inside you, and he's promised to do this. I believe it. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just naive, but I believe when Jesus makes a promise, he means it. In spite of Bob. In spite of Bob. And so he's done this with Stephen in a phenomenal way, and he's recorded it for us. Because remember, there's nothing special about Stephen. Don't make Stephen, Saint Stephen, I mean, don't go there and, and make that, oh, I can't never do. Stephen's an ordinary guy who was just willing to allow God to use him. And as we're going to talk about, willing to what? Die. I thought about this message coming on January 1st. And uh, Chuck, was, Chuck was saying about resolutions. I mean, it's a, this is, I mean, I thought to myself, wow, it's actually a perfect day for this thing. Because you go into the new year. I mean, and I don't know what's how this year is going to play out. But I want to be resolved to stand firm for my Savior. Come what may through the course of this year. Four years ago, you would have never thought we we're, we're, would be where we are today. Not only in this nation, but in this world. Things change this fast. You may be being called upon in the same light by the end of this year. I said, no way. I don't have time to go into different things that are in Congress and stuff like that that can just change this nation with one vote. And you saw how fast it happened in 2020 and how they can control the entire world with just a little virus. And I don't mean to downplay that. I don't mean to downplay that. But you get where I'm going. You need to be ready. They couldn't resist it. I believe the Holy Spirit will enable me to be able to do, if, I, if I'm faithful, to stand. So what did they do? Since they couldn't resist his message, they did what they did with Jesus. They found false witnesses, and they brought him before and declared, this guy says he's gonna, you know, that they're going to destroy the temple. Well, he wasn't talking about the temple. As we saw with Jesus, what was the temple that Jesus said that you destroy this temple in three days I will rebuild it? He was talking about himself. Did he do it? 100% he did. So they brought false witnesses in, and they condemned him just like they condemned Jesus, right? But in the midst of it all, we're told, 
that they saw his innocence. That is the key to this whole thing. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, what good is it if when you are being um, persecuted, you're being persecuted because of your guilt? It means nothing. You deserved it. But if you're being persecuted because of the name of Christ, then there are blessing and reward waiting for you. Jesus said, blessed are you when men revalue you for my namesake. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. If they've done it to me, they'll do it to you. Now, here's the deal. Don't go out finding it. I, I had Years ago, I had an employee who wouldn't do her work, but then she claimed she was being persecuted when we attempted to fire her. Do your work. I heard of a guy once that got fired in a factory because he was got handing tracks. True story. He was handing tracks everywhere. And he wanted to claim it as, as persecution for the name of Christ. It wasn't persecution for the name of Jesus. It was persecution because your, your machine's not running. And that's what they're being paid to do. Do you get it? So don't have this persecution complex and bring it on yourself. Live for, the, live for Christ. If persecution comes, be ready to what? Be ready to stand. Let your detractors come against you because of righteousness not because of your guilt. His defense. This is where we're going to kind of slide through. I'm going to let you read this, a lot of this on your own, okay? But Stephen now begins to make this massive address, which is very exciting, okay? But we don't have time for me to read it all, okay? And what he does is he goes through two, two phases of this. First of all, Yahweh's plan of redemption, okay? And as he goes through Yahweh's plan of redemption, you're going to see seven things come up here. There's the call of Abraham. Then there's the communication of that plan, okay, as he, he speaks the plan through, and then he, the continuation of the covenant through Isaac and then Jacob, right, and then you got the carrying out of his plan um, through Joseph and Jacob. You say, well, how does he carry it out through Joseph and Jacob? Well, how does Joseph become a part of this continuation of the plan? How, how does Joseph become part of the, the plan of redemption? You guys know it. Come on. How does this start off? He's sold into slavery. He's persecuted by who? His own brother. His own family. Do you get it? Persecution. Joseph is sold into slavery. And then even there, he's persecuted by uh, Potiphar's wife. Right? And so it's a whole story of this thing. But finally, God makes him number two in line, right? And then Jacob. Jacob comes then as well into Egypt, right? And then you have the call of Moses. Then you have the call of Moses, okay? That God is going to use Moses as a what? As a, as a deliverer, right? Moses thought ahead, too far ahead of time, right? But even there, we're going to see in a moment, they rejected him. And then you have the covenant with Israel, where God begins to reveal what he's going to do. And then you have, he just skips quickly down into a covenant with David, because he's talking about this messianic line and how God has prepared this messianic deliverer that he's, he's working through, okay? Because that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the fulfillment of this entire plan, okay? But coexistent then with this plan of redemption that T Stephen's talking about, he's also talking about Israel's pattern of rejection, okay? And so they rejected Moses, even though they understood that God had given Joseph these dreams and that he was going to be the deliverer, right? They still rejected it, and they sold him off. Then they rejected Moses, right? So are you going to come, you're going to kill me just like you killed the Egyptian, right? And then they rejected him, but they didn't reject him just in Egypt, but they also rejected him when they were in the wilderness multiple times, right? Even his brother and his sister went against him. But the most important one is they rejected Yahweh's covenant. Even there, when, when Moses was up on Mount Sinai getting the covenant, what were the people doing? Say again? Not complaining at that moment. What were they doing while Moses was up on the mountain? Making an idol, making the golden calf. And he comes down and Moses says to Aaron, what did the people do to you? Ah, well, you know, I just took the gold and I threw it in and now came this calf. Really? My, my toddlers come up with better things than that. They rebelled 
and rejected Yahweh's covenant from the get-go. Even when then he sent them into the land. I don't even have this one up there because Stephen doesn't talk about it. But they send them into the land, right? And, and what are the witnesses the, who go up there? They say, oh, no, we can't do it. So they reject it. And then he says they reject then the prophets. They rejected the prophets who spoke of the Messiah to come. In fact, we know from the book of um, Hebrews, Hebrews 11, that even some of the prophets, they saw it in half. They persecuted the prophets. They persecuted the ones who proclaimed the word of God. Think about it. There's a pattern. Even within the people of God, quote unquote. Bring the spiritual application. We're not talking Israel. We're talking who? The church. I want you to think about that one. Or that which is called the church. Because that which was called Israel. Okay? And I think God's going to work again through Israel, through the nation. That's why, they, that's why they became a nation back in 1948. But I understand spiritual application coming from then Israel into the church. Not that the church is Israel and Israel is the church. Okay? We take the spiritual applications, we bring it over. Just as then we saw that the, those who preached the word of God as literal, as truth, were persecuted by their own. Is it no wonder that right now the world is looking to the liberal side of the church to support their agendas? Yeah. Matthew 12, 31. Um, so th in the end, it says they resist it. And you're, you guys, your leaders are doing the same thing. They're resisting the Holy Spirit. And again, that comes from Jesus. Matthew 12, 31 says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. You want to know what the, the, um, the unpardonable sin is? Everybody's always worried about the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's it. Jesus was very clear. Why? Why is it blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Because it's the Holy Spirit who convicts you of righteousness, judgment, and sin. If you will not receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you reject that, you resist the Holy Spirit, there is no means of salvation. Do you get it? It's not going to happen. If you resist his working in your life, and you will not submit yourself to the sovereign hand of God, there is no other forgiveness. There is no other payment for your sins. Payment for sins only comes through the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we sang with Jesus Messiah, that he who knew no sin became what? Sin. In order that I might become, in order that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It's pretty simple. But if you resist that, if you reject what the Holy Spirit's saying and speaking to you, there is no other forgiveness. So here's the deal. If you accept that Jesus Christ is your Savior, quit worrying about the unpardonable sin. Do you get it? But if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, be, be worried about the unpardonable sin because you're committing it. It's pretty simple. Okay. Okay. Well, these guys, they're doing what? They're resisting. One of those, I can't wait till we get to Acts 9. One of these guys resisting is who? Saul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's kicking against the goads, right? That's what we read in Acts 9. Oh, his death, where we get to the end. I love the contrast. They're full of hate. They begin to gnash their teeth at Stephen. I've seen a guy gnash his teeth once. It was, it was all about Paul, actually, which is kind of fun. Actually, they wanted to use the, the previous church I was at, the, the facilities, for a Friday night for a Messianic congregation, which I, I'm all good with. I love the Messianic side of things. But I always like to ask, then, a Messianic on that side where, what they believe about Sunday worship, people worshiping on Sunday, and what they believe about the, the triunity of the Godhead. Because many of them struggle with that. And so this guy, some of you heard this before, but this guy... Um, when I asked him, so what do you do with the people who worship on Sundays? And he says, well, I think God will give you a chance to repent at the, at the judgment seat. Okay, 
So what you're saying is that they're not saved, but that God in his grace will give us a chance to repent. He says, well, yeah. And I said, well, what do you do with the writings in the New Testament, specifically in Colossians? I hate Paul! Oh, yeah, that's what he said. That's exactly I didn't say that, but that's what I'm thinking. I was like, oh, wow, okay. And so, I hate Paul. Wow. He should have never been in the Bible. I mean, just like venom coming out. So my next question always is, so what do you do with Peter? In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says that all the writings of Paul are Scripture. So you get rid of Paul, you got to get rid of Peter, right? You get rid of Peter, you got to get rid of Jesus. You know, and so by the way, what do you think about Jesus? Anyway, so anyways, it was, the deal was all over at that point, right? But I've seen them, that, and I can't imagine what these individuals, how vehemently angry they were. But Stephen was full of, we're told again, the Holy Spirit. Isn't that kind of cool? And in that moment then, he cries out and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. As they're stoning him, as he's dying, he's quoting Jesus. Do you get this? He's quoting Jesus. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Jesus, while he's on the cross, cried to the Father to receive his spirit, right? But then Jesus cries out something else when he's on the cross. Stephen cries it out here too. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I had already had it up there. Yeah. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. This is kind of cool. But, but then I want to end with this challenge then, coming from the life of Stephen. Paul, this is kind of fun for me, because again, this, this cycles all the way through. Saul becomes Paul, right? And so Saul gets converted. We'll see that in Acts 9. And becomes Paul later on in uh, 13, I think, is when he starts being called that. And, um, and then he's the writer of all these epistles, right? And he writes to Stephen at the very end of his life. See, see Paul, at that point, has already been witnessing all over the world, quote-unquote, if you would, at that time, right? And he's in Rome. He's been arrested. He's in Rome. And he's getting ready to die, for the name of Jesus. He was the tool being used by Satan to kill lots of believers. And now at the end of his life, he was going to undergo the same fate. And he says to Timothy, drop down to verse 6, he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I think of that with Stephen. Stephen didn't necessarily state that. It came upon him a little bit faster than it came upon Paul. Paul had the opportunity to, to serve for years before, and he had a little warning that this was going to play out. Stephen didn't have that. But you could say the same about Stephen. He'd run the race. He finished the course. God's, God's purpose for Stephen was now finished on the earth. But I want you to understand that we're here today talking about who? Stephen. Because God's purpose for Stephen was greater than even seeing people saved in his day. He has a legacy. A challenge. That even the one who was the, taking all the coats of the people, even the one who I think probably was instigating his death, understands in the end what it means to be faithful to the end, to death. But Paul precipitates this statement. I'm already being poured out. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith with this challenge to Timothy. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I know I'm getting ready to die. And I'm getting ready to die because of what? Fulfilling my ministry. And so, Timothy, I'm challenging you. Endure the afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Go out and proclaim Jesus. In the end, it's all worth it. It's going to be worth it. But you have to have that what? That eternal perspective. Again, seek first what? Kingdom of God in his 
righteousness. If you don't have that, you will not endure affliction. You will not do the work of an evangelist. You will be more worried about the things of this earth than you are the things of heaven. Man, you've heard me say this numerous times. I just yearn in that day to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Even if I don't hear the good and faithful servant, just the, well done. I just, it's like, babe, that'll do, pig, that'll do. That's all I want to hear, babe. I mean, I, I, I'm a Gentile. So to the Jews, I'm a, I'm a pig. I'm a Schweinhund, right? And so all, you understand that one, don't you? That's exactly right. And uh, you got to talk to the German people, you know, they, they aren't Schweinhund. And so, and, and that's all I am to them. But to Jesus, I'm a co-heir. I'm a child of God. And I just want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. What about you? When you think of Stephen, what do you think of? Well, that was good for him. But what about you? It might be. I mean, you're not living in I Iran. You're not living in Iraq. You're not living in one of these other lands where you're ha going to jail, China, or Indonesia for your faith right now. North Korea, could you imagine? But that which you fear the most might come to your doorstep. Are you ready? What will you do? How faithful are you to witness of your faith? If you're not doing it now, why do you think you're going to do it when persecution comes? To what extent are you willing to suffer for the faith in Christ? Are you willing to die? Now, I know that's easy to talk about right now, but it's something to, 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 to think on. Are you prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's within you? And is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this new year that you have um, allowed us the privilege of witnessing. We know that this is just a marker of man, Lord, and that uh, men chose to make this division of time between last year and this year. But Lord, we, we use it as that, that mindset of, to remind us that, Lord, life is moving on. Uh, time never stops. I can't hold it back. So Lord, I ask that you would help us to be faithful to redeem the time, knowing the days are evil. Lord, that we would not say, oh, I'll wait for tomorrow, but Lord, that we would be faithful today. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here as Chuck had mentioned earlier, Lord, who, who, who don't know you. Lord, what a phenomenal time to have a birthday in you. Uh, the old things have passed away, all things become new. Lord, I pray that you would draw them and that they would not resist the working of your Holy Spirit, but that they would cry out to you and receive you as your Savior. Lord, for those who are your children, Lord, they would not resist if they are resisting. Something that you may be doing in their life, Lord, that they just don't feel like they have the ability to do, but Lord, that they would reach out and they would um, believe by faith that you are with them and that they would um, be bold, Lord, in, in, in stepping forth for you. Lord, help us as an assembly to continue to step forth boldly for you. Lord, I pray for this neighborhood. Lord, for the redemption of those who live in these houses. Lord, along in these streets that are around us. Lord, that you would bring them to yourself. Lord, cause us to be faithful in reaching out to them. Help us to see, even this year, Lord, people from these houses, from these neighborhoods, from these streets, Lord, um, who profess you as, as Christ, has profess you as the Lord of their life, and Lord, that we would have the, the, the joy of seeing that. Lord, give us wisdom as we consider a new facility. Lord, thank you for the growth that you've given us, Lord, but again, as we saw in your word, Lord, with the growth comes growth pains, and so Lord, help us to work through these things to your honor, to your glory, that you, Father, might be magnified amongst men, not just your church, but even those who are in the world. In Christ's name, amen.